We are joined by Eric Baden, a coffee roaster, Q grader, CEO and founder. I used to be a chemical executive and wasn't born with a cup of coffee in my hand. <laughs> what is going to happen in the Chinese coffee market? Nestle was one of them. We can help them make a better product. You cannot really sell any product, I think, that is not a good product just by telling people we're doing it for a good cause. Where do you start? He just literally, he broke out in tears and I said, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Welcome to Bean Stuff. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Eric Baden, and he is a coffee roaster, a Q grader, a CEO and founder of Coffee Commune, involved in Project 86. I mean, it's a, an impressive list. So thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. What did you do before coffee, and how did you get into coffee? Right, yeah, well, it's, it's a valid question, right? Because I wasn't born with a cup of coffee in my hand, even though I am German and we start drinking coffee early. I used to be a chemical executive. I used wow. to work for like a really big German chemical company and they sent me out to Asia when I was 23 years old. I'm 52 now, so more than half of my life I've been around here. Well, there, we're in the US right now. I did that and I did that happily, um, but at some point, um, while in China, I got exposed to a shelter for homeless and handicapped people mm -hmm. uh, run as a kind of a charity by, by expatriates, by people who were not uh, always in China. And through the work with that shelter, um, I had an opportunity to see very different walks of life. And the shelter also was struggling for the money to operate. And so I was thinking about how can we change that? And at some point I got connected to a person from the United States actually who had started to roast coffee in his home and then his friends encouraged him that he should actually sell that because it was really good but he was repatriating and so through the conversation he was so buoyant about what's gonna happen that was 10 years ago mm -hmm. what is gonna happen in the Chinese coffee market so he got me interested in trying that as such a such an avenue mm -hmm. so I learned a little bit of roasting from him and I taught our homeless handicapped refugees <laughs> how to roast wow, that was wow. the starting point uh, and at some point um, I had to make a decision do I stay in my corporate job and mm. just help with this operation um, or do I get out of that and do this full time and and really grow it and in the end that was the decision I took you were talking about teaching people to roast and what, what sort of equipment did you have in those days? Yeah, so that, that's the funny bit in a sense <laughs> because um, I've, I really, with hindsight, I was the one eye teaching in the land of the blind because <laughs> what, what, I, what I had learned about roasting was all that this gentleman knew mm -hmm. and he had started to home roast. So he had Sono Frescos, which give you really, really nice coffee, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very difficult to scale that. And so um, he donated his and I, I had bought... The, exact same one so we had two sono frescoes to go with um in in the shelter and i taught them how to roast with these so it was always like one pound of coffee at a time and that was exactly why it couldn't continue like that because mm. they couldn't get the proper licensing for doing that in the places they were leave alone put a real big roaster in there mm. so. so i had to go and i went to yunnan for learning roasting proper so um, i went to a coffee school there um and my roasting instructor actually had a big heart for the farmers. He, he was Chinese. He came out of a farming family, not coffee farming, but a farming family. He had moved mm -hmm. to Yunnan. Mm -hmm. And as we shared what our motivations were to do this, um, one, one evening he had invited me to his home. And he just literally, he broke out in tears. And I said, mm -hmm. what did I say? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> And he said, no, it's just, it's, it's, it's tears of joy because I finally found someone who shares my passion for these farmers. Mm -hmm. I, I'll take you tomorrow and I'll show you what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so he took me, um, the day when the, the roasting course was over, he took me uh, to the farms. And I saw, like, people, beautiful people, minority people, uh, working very, very hard, but in dismal conditions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I just wanted to know exactly what was going on. And that was the starting point of Coffee Commune because I said, okay, this is the root of the problem. Because the homeless handicap that we were picking up in the streets of Shanghai and rehabilitating over two years, mm -hmm. the, 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 typically their walks of life were that they were farmers somewhere. The farms wouldn't earn them enough to sustain their families. They would leave wife and kin children behind to mm -hmm. take care of the farms and go work construction. 
And then they would have an accident and they would get kicked out on the streets and they would pretend to be dead because they would otherwise be a burden for the family. Mm. Right? So really, really wow. sad stories mm. uh, that, that all start with the farm being too small and the price for the product being too low for them to be able to to feed their family. And so that's how we got started and said, like, well, we can, we can and we should do something about the starting point of the problem. Mm -hmm. We can't really make the farms bigger that these people own, mm -hmm. but we can help them make a better product on those farms so that they get a better price. So that's what we're all about, to, to equip the farmers um, through teaching them better farming uh, methodologies, by uh, teaching them how to process the coffee right so that it becomes specialty grade coffee, yeah. by investing, which they can't, they can't, they don't have the resources to invest in the right equipment. So they normally use equipment that was originally built for rice or wheat, mm -hmm. and it damages the beans when they when they when they pulp or hull. Mm -hmm. And then once the right equipment is there, teach them how to use it. So then we have actually a really good product, a really nice, interesting, clean specialty mm. coffee. Mm. And then comes the last bit that's extremely important because they have no way to do that themselves. We need to find buyers for their coffee. So we need to be the bridge for the direct trade. We need to be able to show these coffees to interested well, specialty well. roasters around the world as yeah. a new varietal that is not yet very common. That's, that sounds like a lot of work. It sounds good work. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get any help from others or? Yeah, well, it's actually interesting. There is um, a very small um, community of foreigners in Yunnan um, that share the same passion. There's mm -hmm. a couple of people around and we all know each other and we all compare notes with each other and we all share some knowledge. So there's like this um, one company is called Yunnan Coffee Traders. Um, uh, that's an Aussie and an American together doing that. Wow. And then there is a Torch Coffee Company. That, that's the school where I went to. So they're focusing on education in okay. general, mm -hmm, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and there is um, some others that um, are more working on an in individual basis um, who have actually joined us in Project 86 Plus, um, mm -hmm. Americans and Canadians that that work with us now in the project, even though they're not like on my payroll, but we're working together mm. yeah. and sharing our expertise and sharing our manpower that we need to be mm. on all these farms and, yeah. and help these farms like consistently improve their, their processing methods. Mm. What are some of the typical things you need to help them with? They may be basic things, they may be complicated things, but what, is it machinery? Is it how to grow the plant? We, I mean, I think, where do you start? The situation at the outset um, generally is that these families have been in coffee farming two, three, maybe four generations. Okay. So it's, it's relatively young. Mm -hmm. So wow. coffee came to China 100 years ago with a French missionary. But then it was not used commercially. It was just he planted coffee because he wanted coffee. Then in, in the 1980s, um, actually tea prices slumped. And, and China, mm -hmm. Yunnan, the poor region in particular, are, are world famous for tea. Actually, mm -hmm. commercial tea farming started in Pu'er. So mm. tea cultivation for commercial purposes started where we are now having our coffee center in, yeah. in, in Yunnan. Mm -hmm. um, so in the 1980s, tea prices slumped so much that tea farmers were in trouble. And yeah. so then uh, the government there actually encouraged them to plant coffee instead. And there were some big companies around that wanted coffee. Mm -hmm. um, Nestle was one of them. Mm -hmm. And they provided a lot of know-how at the time. It was a good thing. Mm -hmm. They provided a lot of know-how in the 1980s, how to grow coffee, how to plant it, and so on. But the target there was volume, not, not quality, because it was for yeah. soluble coffees, for instant coffees. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so choice of varietal, Katimur. Mm. Um, and processing methods, just do everything, get, get coffee quick, big volumes of coffee quickly. But it was done very professionally. So even to like the present day, mm -hmm. farmers think that's the way coffee is generally done. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to get in and say, all right, well, you can do coffee that way, but you see where it's gotten you. Mm. They, they really struggle to survive. So if you do a few things a little different, then you get a much different quality of coffee. And then you can also get a much different price for your coffee. It's a bit more effort. Mm -hmm. And so the, the tricky bit in the beginning always is they need to take a leap of faith and trust that if they do that extra effort, 
work a bit harder, mm -hmm. work a bit more hours, um, that they would in the end actually get a significantly better income. Wow. So we start with looking at soil analysis and okay. foliar analysis to wow. see how they should actually fertilize. There's so many little things yeah. that <clears throat> impact the result of a simple thing, put fertilizer on the ground, right? Yeah. So that's one. Um, then pruning their, their plantations um, is something extremely important because they were always oriented towards um, yield, like just have a lot of coffee. Mm. They were very um, hesitant to cut away apparently good branches. But the fact yeah. is, these branches yeah. produce so much leaves, so many leaves, so much foliage. It just takes away way too much nutrition mm -hmm. from the cherries. So you would actually get less cherries, even though you wouldn't expect it. Mm -hmm. right. And the cherries that you get wouldn't have the same density, wouldn't have the same sweetness because they just lack nutrients. Yeah. So we, we actually have to go to enormous lengths, basically telling them, look, <laughs> if you cut away half of the branches here, we promise you next season you're going to have more coffee. And they go like, no way. Yes. I can't have more if I, I cut half, half away. <laughs> and they look, you know what? If you get less, we'll still pay you what you had this year. Well, that's good incentive. And they got more and better, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but the, this is the way you, you, you need to do it. It's, mm. it's really, they, they need to see that it works and then, then they embrace it. So the mm. pruning is the other thing. And then picking, because mm. they were picking. Just stripping it strip off. Picking, strip picking. Oh. And, and we had to go and say, look, we, we, we have these, these wristbands, right? So we oh. use these wristbands here. Yeah. yeah. That we give the pickers. And we say, this is the color we want. You can't it's go brilliant. beyond and you can't go much below. So huh. this is a, the color of a perfectly ripe cherry. That's right? good. That's amazing. And so we do that. And um, they have them on both their wrists. And as they pick, they see, is it close to this or is it not? Now, with this simple measure, we got them to above 95% on average, Whoa. perfectly ripe cherries. Wow. Wow. So only less than 5% were either too ripe mm -hmm. or not ripe enough. Now with that, you can really work well with mm -hmm. the coffee. Mm -hmm. wow. And now we said, if you, if you hit that, if you hit 98% for any given batch that you give us, we can pay you twice the market price for your cherries. Whoa. Now, plus, we weight them in glasses, right? We put mm -hmm. them in the same size of glasses, yes. what they normally strip um, oh. harvest, yeah. strip pick, and what they picked selectively. And then we put that, um, we put that on, on a scale mm. and the full glass, was, well, full glass, it was 100 cherries. So we, mm -hmm. how many cherries? 100 cherries. One glass would overflow, the other one was, would be two thirds full. Mm -hmm. One was exactly twice the weight than the other. Now that, means you get more that you get paid for and you get paid more for what you bring. Wow. So in the end, that means tripling the income. Oh, wow. and, and that is exactly what we are about, what we're after, because if mm. we can get them to twice to three times the income that they used to have when they were just doing the old yeah. ways that they had been taught 30 mm -hmm. years ago, 40 years ago, then that means they can actually afford to put in sanitation in their villages, mm. which means they will be sick less, mm. yeah. which means they will have more mm. energy, which yeah. means wow. they will have actually a better harvest because they can finish it before everything drops to the ground. Yeah. Um, they can actually afford the boarding fees for the kids to attend school all year round. Wow. So that is then eventually one, two generations later, the ticket out of this poverty cycle because wow. they, they they have other options mm. now these other options also have a downside because once they have other options they say no this life is too hard for me i want to go to the city i want to do another job so then there is going to be eventually there's going to be this other issue that we need to tackle too mm. few people to go around to actually mm. take care of all the farms can you think of one person you've seen come from that start that you were talking about of how not to pick and how to pick the tree who are now involved more fully and what's their life look like now compared to what it was then? Right. But, well, I mean, what, any, pretty much any of the farmers we work yes. with, but one, Mr. Liu, he is in a farm. Um, Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu, yeah, like L, L, L I U. <laughs> so he he is he's actually relatively young, mm -hmm. um, and he is um, in a farm that's an eight-hour car ride away from Puar, where we normally land when we come like mm -hmm. from outside with with an airplane, and 
And he actually has a farm so small, he does it just with his wife. He and his wife take care of the farm. How, so, how so big are we talking? We don't hit well, acres or? Yeah, so he has um, less than two acres. Um, typical small farms that we are working with are all less than three acres. Wow. So he's even there, like more on the smaller side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he's, he's been very motivated. So he's been in the program um, for three years now. Program meaning like Project 86 Plus only started formally with this current harvest that's just over now. Oh, but, I didn't realize that, yeah. But, but, some, but we've been working with farms before mm -hmm. and um, he in particular has been uh, working with our partners from the US and Canada, as I said, that joined us in Project 86 Plus. Mm -hmm. So um, he very readily tells this story. He said like, well, when we, get, when we got started with coffee, we had these high hopes and then we were really like disillusioned when our first harvest, mm. well, it's sold, but we, we didn't even get the money for the fertilizer back from that. And then with the exposure to our partners that are with us in Project 86 Plus, they decide, okay, we will go on, we will see what they are telling us. And he said it was like a totally unexpected, different mm. situation when they finished their first harvest with help. Mm and they got twice the money. Nestle was one of them for what their, what their farm was producing. And now with Project 86 Plus, it's, it's gotten again more because the learning curve keeps, keeps going, right? So they, mm. they get better and better at what they're doing. So um, they were originally thinking of stopping again with coffee. You know, it was a bad idea to get in coffee. They were really discouraged at the beginning. And now they're making plans of, okay, how do we put money aside so that eventually maybe we can get more land and we can, we can wow. grow in coffee. The, one of the beautiful things that we always encourage is when we work with a farm or a cluster of farms, like a village, mm. um, we equip them in a, in, in a way that they can teach the others. Then, Once they've been doing two or three seasons, mm -hmm. they are proficient in what to do because we also tell them why. Mm. It's not just, okay, you have to so pick these um, just because we say so. Yeah. Mm. So they, they learn how to do it, but they also learn why to do it that way. They learn the effects of the different fermentation lengths and processes, mm. or if it's anaerobic or not anaerobic, if it's 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, or if it's low temperature anaerobic mm. for a week or for two weeks. Wow. I mean, we, we, we do all these things as, as test series with them. And we log it all, like all the temperatures, all the moisture levels yeah, every day. Everything gets recorded wow. so that we can actually, in the end, pretty much scientifically evaluate that and then share with them which processing method seems to be suitable for their particular terroir mm. and for what the market wants, obviously. Is it harder for like the implementing new technology and new skills, or is it harder to get rid of old habits? Like you were talking about Nestle coming <laughs> in and saying quantity, but yeah. yeah, I guess is it harder to get the old out or bring in the new? Yeah, well, breaking the old habits is, is hard. Mm. Um, and it's also because we're not necessarily the first ones who come and say we want to do something different or you should do something different. And if they've, yeah. some of them, many of them have also ex had, have had bad experiences in the sense that they were told something um, but then the, the rewards that were promised weren't given. Mm. And so it's, it's really important to, to create trust. Mm. And so that, that, is, that is probably the hardest in the beginning, but it's also in the end not difficult to do as long as you stay true to what you're set out to do. Right? Mm. So we're, 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 we're there because we want these farmers to get out of the poverty cycle. We want them mm. to have a new hope. Yeah. That's why I got out of my corporate career. That's why I started Coffee Commune. That's what everybody in the company wants to see. Mm. Now, we also want and need to make money with the company. We need to be profitable to be able to keep doing this. Yeah. But we are not trying to maximize our income and then again on, on the backs of the farmers. It's, mm -hmm. it's the opposite. We're trying to get the farmers a fair income and we are confident that that way we can also make a living. Mm -hmm. uh, because what comes out of it, you, you, let, let me rephrase it this way. You, you cannot really sell 
any product, I think, that is not a good product just by telling people we're doing it for a good cause. Mm. You, you, you may be lucky to sell some of it, right. and you may also be lucky to get a little bit of a premium over what is a fair market price, perhaps for a standard product. Right. But it's not going to last. People go like, you know what, I really didn't like that coffee, I really didn't like that whatever they bought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they will not buy it again. They, they said, okay, I, I've done my, my good deed, but mm -hmm. now I want my other coffee again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need to have a really good product. Now, if we have a really good product, that will sell. Mm. It will sell whether it's for a good cause or not. Right. But if it's a good product and it's for a good cause, mm. people, will, people will happily come back and mm. buy it again and again and talk about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the root of it, that we go like saying, we need to have an impact on the quality of the product. That's mm. what we need to do. If we do that right, if that results in a specialty grade coffee and Project 86 Plus, our mission there is like to get to specialty coffee that is truly special. Mm. Yeah. Right? It's not just a coffee that makes the points, but it's a coffee that mm. when cuppers cup it, mm. they go like, well, that has a character that's different. That's something I enjoy that I haven't seen in a Kenyan or in an Ethiopian or in a Colombian. Yeah. So that it, it has its own right that a Yunnan coffee is going to be on the table in the mix of, of origins, mm. where people say, I like that one. Mm. Mm. It doesn't have to be everybody likes it. Not everybody likes a Kenyan. Yeah. Right? Not everybody right. is, is so, really? much in favor of, <laughs> <laughs> so much in favor of an Ethiopian. Some yeah. people just like mm -hmm. the notes that you only get in a Costa Rican. All mm -hmm. right, good. So in the same way, there mm. needs to be a space. There is a space. Mm. I'm, I'm certain of it. There's a space for a properly developed, clean Yunnan. Mm. We just need to get it developed and then we need to get it out there that people realize this is how a Yunnan tastes and I like mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we get to that point, there is going to be people who pay the same prices for it that they now easily, readily pay for mm -hmm. the more established origins. Mm -hmm. And then we have a really great potential for, for getting these about 300,000 small farmers that are growing coffee in Yunnan wow. out of their currently pretty dismal situation. Thank you for watching part one of our interview with Eric Baden. We're excited to share more with you in the coming weeks. Stay tuned.